Hello and welcome to this video where today we're looking at electromagnetic waves as part of the turning points optional module um, and these are really the two things we need to know. We need to know how Maxwell theoretically predicted electromagnetic waves and how Hertz then experimentally tested Maxwell's predictions. Um, so James Clark Maxwell was a Scottish physicist and he worked on electricity and magnetism and basically unified the two into um, electromagnetism. He came up with four equations, which we don't really we don't need to have a look at at all. Um, but these are collectively known as Maxwell's equations. When he did some work on these, he found that some of the solutions to these equations um, were waves, and that they all travelled at a characteristic speed, which is this value here. So in theory, the speed of these waves is given by this equation here. So these are both constants. So epsilon zero is your permittivity of free space that we met when we looked at electric fields, and the mu zero is the permit permeability of free space that we looked at and we use that when we looked at magnetic fields and so when you put these two together um, and we work out the square root and we find the reciprocal of that then it gives us a certain value and so not surprisingly when he did this he, cal he put these numbers in and he got a value of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second so in, he actually theoretically predicted the speed of light the exam board also needs you to know what these things really mean. So this thing relates the strength of an electric field to the charge that creates the electric field. And mu naught, which is our permeability of free space, relates the magnetic flux density, which is basically how strong the magnetic field is, um, to the current that's creating the magnetic field. So he did this work and he found that there were some waves that travelled at this speed. But they wasn't, it wasn't just light, he predicted a whole spectrum of um, electromagnetic waves. He then also looked at the characteristics of waves and actually how the electric and the magnetic fields actually interacted. Um, now in an exam situation, you're, you can potentially be asked to draw these electromagnetic waves or to describe the nature of them. If you're asked to describe the nature of them, then just draw a picture. Um, basically what the three things the exam board are looking for is that the electric field and the magnetic field are in phase. So in other words, when there is a peak in the electric field, there's a peak in the magnetic field. Both the electric field and the magnetic field oscillate, and they oscillate in a transverse way. And also, on top of that, um, both the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, and also the direction that the energy is transferred in. So in, if the energy is transferred in this way, the electric field might oscillate this way, and the magnetic field oscillates this way. Like I say, if you draw a diagram, often that really, really helps um, and that'll get you all three marks without having to actually do any writing. It's still better to actually write these things down though. So that's what Maxwell did. They were the, they were kind of, as far as we're concerned, they were the two big predictions that he came up with. So Hertz then tried to actually experimentally test some of these predictions. So what he needed to do was first of all generate some electromagnetic waves. So what he started off with, he started off with a high potential difference over here. And what he essentially built himself was a capacitor. So you've got two metal plates. So you've got a plate up here and also a plate down on the bottom as well. And these two metal plates are almost connected together, but there's a very small gap in between the, the wires that would connect these two things together. And when a big potential difference built up, because charge diff opposite charges built up on these plates, what you would get is you would basically get a spark across the gap. So when, when there is a spark across the gap, um, there's a current flowing for a very short amount of time. And so because there's a current flowing, um, you get a magnetic field around here. So you get an electric field being induced, and that electric field in turn induces a magnetic field, and that induces an electric field, and so actually you create a, a very short pulse of electromagnetic waves. The electromagnetic waves then travel out from here, and he was able to detect them because he basically put here um, a circle of wire. So here you've got basically a ring of metal, and in that ring there was a very small gap. So as the electromagnetic waves pass along here, um, the magnetic part of this basically of the electromagnetic wave passed through here so you the 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 ring experienced a changing magnetic flux and as we know if by faraday's law if there's a change in magnetic flux then there's an emf in here and so because the gap in heat and this thing was really small as the emf was generated as a current generated and so you saw a spark here as well so he knew automatically when there was a spark being created the electromagnetic waves were being given out here. So from this he was able to then, he knew that electromagnetic waves were being generated and so he was able to do some experiments on these things. 
So what he did is, first of all, um, he wanted to see what happened if he put things in the way. So he put metal sheets in the way and he found that that stopped the sparks altogether. So sparks were still being generated on this side, but when there was a metal sheet here, nothing happened. So either the, the electromagnetic waves are being absorbed by the metal sheet or they were being reflected away. He put an insulator in the way instead, so not a conductor, and that had no effect whatsoever. He still saw sparks, so he knew that the electromagnetic waves could travel through insulated materials. Um, he then play, basically blocked this off with a metal plate, but then put a metal, another metal plate up here so the electromagnetic waves could travel up here, and then they could basically either be reflected or absorbed by this metal plate. And he found that he then saw sparks here, so he concluded from that that these things could be reflected. So actually metal plates reflect um, electromagnetic waves. So then he decided that what he would do is he would place a concave metal plate over here and basically what happened is as the electromagnetic waves came along they were then reflected off of here and they were reflected like this and so actually what happens is you get a much stronger spark here because more of the electromagnetic waves are being focused onto here. So in the end he could conclude that, mag so that magnetic waves were reflected by metal plates. Um, the exam board specifically want you to know that um, electromagnetic waves can be reflected by metal sheets and if you put a concave metal sheet, so a, a bent metal sheet over here, that it would focus the electromagnetic waves onto here and so you get a bigger spark. He then wanted to actually do some measurements on these things. He wanted to calculate the speed and the wavelength of these. So now he knows that these things can be reflected by this metal plate over here. So we've got this metal plate. He then went back to his wave theory because he knows that he knew that these things were waves and they can be reflected. So we've got electromagnetic waves being given out in this direction. They then get reflected off of here. So we thought, ah, that reminds me of standing waves. And if you remember from um, last year's standing waves, if you've got a traveling wave that travels, for example, in this direction, and then it gets reflected at the opposite end, um, you then, what you essentially you've got is two waves traveling in opposite directions, but the two waves have got the same wavelength and frequency and approximately the same amplitude. And if you do that, the waves superpose and you end up with a standing wave. So we have a standing wave here, standing wave. And if you remember from last year, what you end up with is you end up with nodes where there's basically no amplitude and you end up with antinodes. So antinodes where the amplitude is of the standing wave is a maximum. And so he was able to use this because basically what he did is he took this, this spark detector now because he knows that when there's sparks here electromagnetic waves are you can actually detect them electromagnetic waves and what he noticed as he moved this along was that sometimes he got sparks and that lots of sparks and then he'd move it along and then he saw no sparks and then he'd move it along and see lots of sparks so where there were no sparks that's when the detector was at a node and when he got lots of sparks that was when the detector was at an antinode so from that he was able to measure the distance between two nodes for example and then double it and that gave him the wavelength of these particular waves. The frequency of the, of the sparks that were being generated equaled the frequency of the electromagnetic waves that were being generated because um, the electric field is essentially changing when a spark is created and he, set, he connected this to a circuit that regularly provided enough charge to provide sparks. So he knew the frequency that the sparks were created and because of that he knew the frequency of the waves. So therefore he knows the free wavelength and the frequency of the waves. So simply by using this equation over here he was able to calculate the speed of these waves. And surprisingly he ended up showing that these electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light which is exactly the same number that Maxwell predicted. So in the end, he was able to experimentally show that these things are electromagnetic waves and that Maxwell's theory was correct. He then went on to think, well, okay, so if Maxwell's correct, then these things must be transverse waves. So how am I going to how am I going to look at polarization? Well, he did something different. He, instead of using the magnetic field, so it, all of this um, induced EMF and, and sparks depend upon looking at or detecting the, the changing magnetic field. He thought, instead, I'll look at what happens with the change in the electric field. And he built something called a dipole um, detector. What that consists of is, is essentially you've got um, two pieces of metal. So you've got two pieces of metal like this. So two basically two metal aerials. 
um, and they're almost connected together, but again, there's a gap. So he was still detect detecting sparks, but this time from the electric part of the EM waves, not the magnetic field. And when an electric, when the electric part of the wave comes along, so you've got to remember the magnetic one, the magnetic part is coming along at, at the same frequency, but whenever the electric part of the wave comes along, it forces the electrons to move, and because it forces electrons to move. Um, you get a difference again between here and here. So the electrons will flow one way and so you'll end up with a spark. So this thing, so essentially he's got a dipole. Um, so because one of these things potentially will become positive and one will become negative. So he's made a dipole and so the, the electrons would flow. Um, now, what he then, so he did it in this way and when he found that the dipole was um, parallel to the electric field, part of the electromagnetic wave, then again he saw sparks. So he got sparks when these things were parallel. So parallel basically meant sparks. He then basically took this dipole thing and basically turned it on its side so it now looked like this. And then, um, not surprisingly, he didn't see any sparks whatsoever. And then when he continued to turn it around through another 90 degrees, he went back to this thing and he saw sparks. And so he was able to show again that these things could be polarized. So in the end, he was able to show every, every single thing that Maxwell actually predicted. Um, he, he, he was able to show that electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light. And he was also able to show that there's both an electric and a magnetic part of this wave. They're both transverse waves and actually... Um, he was also able to show um, that they were perpendicular to the direction that, the, that these waves were travelling in because they could be polarised in that particular direction. In terms of a summary of actually what he measured, um, the radio waves from the transmitter are polarised anyway. Whenever he used a loop like this, you've got to think about magnetic field because it's the magnetic field that of the, the magnetic field oscillations from the electromagnetic wave basically mean um, that you get a changing EMF in here and so you get a current and so you get a spark. In this case you were really looking at the electric field in which case you have a dipole detector and that's basically detecting the electric field oscillations. So they're very slightly different although they are related because if you think about it if this thing is perpendicular to the magnetic field it's actually going to be parallel to the electric field as well. So um, they're related but actually they're looking at very very slightly different things. So if we go back to what we need to know um, basically we need to know about Maxwell and what he predicted. So he predicted the characteristics of electromagnetic waves in terms of oscillating electric magnetic fields and he predicted the speed of light and then Hertz experimentally produced radio waves which, should, which were one of the types of waves that Maxwell predicted. He showed that they could be reflected and polarized, that stationary waves can be formed and from an exam point of view you have to be able to explain how he used a reflection in order to create standing waves, uh, basically show or explain roughly how he did, how he was able to show that these things are polarized and in particular the big exam questions that they ask you about are basically stationary waves and then from that you're, you'll be asked to calculate the wavelength, you'll be told for example the frequency and by using your wave equation you can work out the speed. So they're the big exam questions that they tend to ask. They're about stationary waves. So that was um, a very quick summary of electromagnetic waves. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.